Hello, welcome to Over the Hill Outdoors. This is the first of six videos in which I'll, I'll bring you along with me on a, on a solo five-day walkabout in this, the Great Basin Desert of northwestern Utah. I hope you'll enjoy the adventure as much as I did. But first I want to set the stage by answering a few basic questions you might have, like, what is the Great Basin? Where is it? And what exactly do I mean by a walkabout? We'll begin with the Great Basin. The Great Basin is a very large area in the western United States that covers more than 200,000 square miles and extends over parts of at least five states. It gets its name from the fact that hydrologically it's a giant bowl. In other words, all the precipitation that falls in the basin eventually either evaporates, seeps into underground aquifers, or, or it collects in salty, shallow lakes with no outlets, such as the Great Salt Lake in northern Utah. None of the water flows to the ocean. That's key. Neither to the Atlantic Ocean nor the Pacific Ocean. It stays in the Great Basin. The Great Basin Desert makes up over half of the Great Basin itself. It covers nearly all of Nevada and almost half of Utah. My walkabout took place in a remote region of that desert near the northwest edge of the Great Salt Lake. The annual precipitation in the area where I hiked is around oh, 8 to 10 inches per year, I believe. As you're seeing, uh, the terrain of the Great Basin Desert includes low mountains and foothills, some plains or lake terraces, and then dry lake beds, often covered in salt. The key vegetation species uh, in the basin includes uh, juniper, uh, pinyon pine, oftentimes mixed juniper and pinyon pine, sagebrush, lots of sagebrush, cheatgrass, and, uh, and then a number of other salt-tolerant shrubs and forbs that have, have uh, evolved or developed to, to survive, even thrive, in this kind of harsh environment. So there's a little summary of what the Great Basin is and where it is. Next, I want to try to explain what I consider to be a walkabout. What are the the elements or the ingredients of a walkabout as, as I see it. There's probably as many definitions and interpretations of the word walkabout as there are people who have done one. So it's not my intent to say, you know, what's the right way to do a walkabout. I'm just saying what my version of a walkabout is. First of all, uh, my walkabouts are not about demonstrating or, or testing my wilderness survival skills basic outdoor survival skills are a part of it, but really only a relatively small part of a walkabout. A walkabout is much more than, than surviving in nature with minimal amount of gear. Um, it's more than just going for a long hike. I prefer to call a walkabout a wander and ponder experience in the wilderness. For me, the main purpose of a walkabout is to recharge. It's an opportunity to refocus or recalibrate, to refresh or reboot my soul. It clears my mind, it helps me recognize those most important things in my life, the things that, that bring me the greatest meaning. A walkabout I think is especially beneficial in preparation for some significant milestone in one's life. In my case, I'll be turning 65 here in a couple of months and for me, that's, that's reason enough for a good walkabout. If you were to ask me for my recipe for an effective walkabout, I'd say it has at least eight key ingredients. The relative amount of each one is up to you and your personal taste, but, but here's what I put in my walkabout recipe. Number one, nature. Lots and lots of nature. It's the primary ingredient. Number two, solitude. To be completely alone 
not even bringing your favorite pet along with you. Third ingredient would be time, plenty of time, plenty of time to wander and ponder, at least four or five days and nights. Number four, physical discomfort, at least a little bit. The old adage about no pain, no gain, I think that applies to a walkabout. Number five, some hunger, hunger and thirst, not starvation, just a degree of hunger. Discovery, experience some new places or new things. Number seven would be risk. Just being alone out there in the wilderness increases risk. It doesn't have to be a, a high, high risk, but increase the level of risk in your life a little bit. And the last one, number eight, a minimal amount of gear. Some, some reliance on survival skills. I limited my survival gear to, to 12 items. They were a knife, a pruning saw, a ferro rod, two metal canteens, some paracord, a two-quart cooking pot, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, a hammock that also served as a bivy bag if I wanted to put it on the ground, a 10 by 10 foot tarp, and a headlamp. And then in addition to these 12 items, I had, of course, my camera gear, some basic safety gear, some emergency food rations, and, and some extra clothing. My daily food ration consisted of six ounces, or 170 grams, which provided between 650 and 700 calories per day. And then I could supplement that with whatever else I could find. So there you have it. I've introduced you to the Great Basin. I've told you what I hope to accomplish on my walk about there. And now I invite you to come along with me as I spend five days in this unique and beautiful part of the world.